my course of my teaching, my students decided we should collect books and send them to Africa. In fact, we should collect millions of books and send them to Africa because African children need books. And it made tremendous sense. And we did this for years. The football team would load the books onto containers. We would go around the neighborhood and collect books. It was a wonderful project. Except then I actually went to Africa and I visited some of the libraries that had received the books. And they were there. No one read them. They were on shelves. And I was very perplexed and it didn't occur to me immediately what was going on. Uh, except that um, if you live in Zambia and you speak Chichewa and some Americans send you a whole bunch of their favorite books, <laughs> you can see why they might not get used. In fact, the enormous cost of doing this and the tremendous pride we had in doing this was uh, difficult for me to understand. So the more I became involved working with African teachers, I, I met a wonderful teacher. She was a teacher in a small school for girls in the desert of northern Kenya where there are no roads. People are camel traders and they leave the girls there for a few months and they come back and get them later and um, they have no books. And so she and I talked about, well, you can't learn to read without books. You just can't do it. What could you do? And out of this came something called the African Storybook Project. We sat down and we said, wait a second, how could we get books? I mean, there are 2,000 languages in Africa. No publisher is going to publish on 2,000 languages they can't afford to. Um, where are we going to get these books? And they have to be culturally appropriate. I mean, kid, young children who are four years old need to see themselves in books, not Snow White. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Even books by African American authors seldom met the test, even though that was a terrible lesson. Bob Marley, everybody understands, but not necessarily Rosa Parks. I mean, I think you would, but actually it's not true. So out of this came the African Storybook Project. We developed a project which in the last four years has created almost 700 books in 78 African languages, not by writing the books for people, but by going to communities and letting people write their own stories. Now, some of these languages were, you know, the people don't know how to write in, the, in these languages because their languages have been almost completely marginalized by English and French and other uh, post-colonial languages. But the literature, the stories, the song, the poems, the riddles, the myths, the, the science, they're all there. And all it took was to give people tools to write their own stories. You can go online now and you can read African stories in 78 African languages right now. And we're hoping someday to get to that 2000. So what happened, you see? What happened was you can have a great idea and it can be wonderful, but it doesn't necessarily make it right. But if you have the courage to face your mistakes, sometimes you can actually find a better idea. And I think when you face Africa, Americans are very unwilling to face Africa. It seems too big to, to something, a whole set of things. But actually, every African community has its literature, its artists, its writers, its poets, and it's people who want their own language to be respected and want their children to be able to read it and write it. So that's the African Storybook, and we would love you to go online and to africanstorybook.org and see almost 3,000 
stories now in four years, and we hope 100,000 in 10 years. Thank you.